Welcome, good afternoon um, to this webinar about the parallels between flood mitigation planning in Hamburg, Germany and Alexandria, Virginia. I'm Dale Medeiros. I'm a senior regional planner for the Northern Virginia Regional Commission, the NBRC. We are a regional council of governments that represents the 13 counties, cities and towns and two and a half million people of Northern Virginia. And for years, we've worked to find and apply urban sustainability innovations from pioneering cities overseas, such as Hamburg. And in the pursuit of adopting policy and technical innovations from abroad, we have relied on the help and support of our local governmental partners like the city of Alexandria and its staff, like Daniel and Matthew. And of course, our academic science and research partners like George Mason University. In 2022, George Mason University launched the Virginia Climate Center. It's a partnership to accelerate applied research that supports the development and implementation of local level climate resilience strategies. And this year, we were proud to partner with them in this type of work. And we have the privilege of sharing with you just how this kind of partnership between local governments, science, research institutions, works on the global stage to support and advance climate resiliency planning in cities like Alexandria. And so we brought together a really exceptional panel of science, research, and local governmental technical staff. They include Dr. Cecil Ferrer from George Mason University, Dr. Daniel Medina of the City of Alexandria, Matthew Landis, also of the City of Alexandria, and my colleague, Rebecca Murphy from the NBRC. Since it's not every day that we have such a um, rich constellation of experts and science and local practitioners together, um, sharing this mission, I'd like to read the bios of my, my colleagues. Uwe Carsonson is a freelance consultant in the field of urban development, planning, and building culture. Uwe was born in 1968 and holds a university degree in architecture from the Technical University of Braunschweig. After graduating in 2000, Uwe started working for the city, of the Hamburg Chamber of Commerce and later joined the state-owned city development company, Hoffen City. As an assistant to the executive before becoming a freelance consultant in 2006. As a freelance consultant with a focus on target group communications, Carstensen helped with the development of the International Building Exhibition in Hamburg in 2013 with the planning and the implementation. Uwe has worked with other aspects and other departments of the city of Hamburg, including the development of the University of Hamburg. He's regularly commissioned as an expert to guide uh, uh, tourists and experts interested in studying the sustainability aspects of the Hoffman City program. Dr. Daniel Medina is the stormwater program manager for the city of Alexandria, Virginia. He has over 30 years of experience in water resource planning in program implementation. He obtained a civil engineering degree from the University de los Andes, Bogota, Colombia, and a PhD from Cornell University. His experience encompasses a wide range of water resources areas, including flood risk management, water supply, watershed restoration, and climate resilience. He's led projects in North America, Latin America, and the Caribbean, and was recently test invited to testify before the US Senate Environment and Public Works Committee on the effects of uncontrolled highway runoff of receiving waters. He also serves as a consultant to the World Bank and the Inter-American oh. Development Bank. Matthew Landis is a division chief in the Department of Project Implementation for the City of Alexandria. He's a licensed landscape architect, certified construction manager, and a certified arborist. Matthew serves as the program manager for the city's waterfront implementation program is the, and is the portfolio manager for several sponsored portfolios for the Parks and Recreation Department and the Office of Historic Alexandria. Matt started with the city in 2015 as a principal planner and landscape architect. After practicing as a professional landscape architect and certified arborist in the private sector with a special focus on green infrastructure, low impact development strategies, and secure site design. Dr. Celso Ferrer is an associate professor in the civil infrastructure and in environmental engineering department at George Mason University and leads the Mason Flood Hazards Research Lab. Dr. Ferrer holds a PhD from Texas A&M University in civil engineering specializing in water resources and coastal engineering. Celso is also a registered professional, professional engineer in the state of Maryland. His current research interests are associated with water-related extreme weather hazards and their impacts on civil engineering infrastructure and societies. His work is focused on flood hazards from coastal, riverine, and urban environments, it includes real-time flood forecasting, monitoring storm surges, and supporting incorporation of natural systems into coastal flood defenses. Dr. Furr is currently part of the author team for the fifth National Climate Assessment 
Coastal Effects chapter with US Global Change Research Program. And finally, my colleague Rebecca Murphy is the Coastal Program Manager at the Northern Virginia Regional Commission. She currently manages the Commission's Regional Coastal Resources Management Program through coordination with local jurisdictions and serves as a representative on statewide committees for coastal and Chesapeake Bay protection and restoration. Rebecca also administers programming to support the growth, connectivity, and safety of the region's recreational trails, including work for the Potomac Heritage and National Scenic Trail. Prior to joining NVRC, Rebecca worked as a watershed management and community engagement project officer at the local and regional levels to advance conservation efforts for tributaries in the Chesapeake Bay. She holds a Bachelor's of Science in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology from Tulane University and a Master in Environmental Management from Duke. So the program for the webinar is simple. Uh, Mr. Carstensen will share his work in Hamburg to promote sustainable flood mitigation for the city. And then he'll be followed by Daniel and Matt, who will introduce their work uh, with an equivalent set of challenges confronting Alexandria. And my colleague Rebecca then will facilitate a question and answer session. If you have any questions, please pop them into the question and answer box. Um, you'll, the participants will be muted during the presentation. This presentation will be recorded, um, but unmuted during the, the Q&A. Um, we aim to finish around 1.15 um, or between 1.15 and 1.30. Thank you very much. Celso, any thoughts to share? Sure, thanks, Dale. So I am Celso Freire, an associate professor here at George Mason University. Thanks, Dale, for your introduction. I'm delighted to see everybody on the call today. And on behalf of George Mason University, I would like to welcome everyone to this uh, webinar. <clears throat> and I also wanted to bring um, two key points uh, to this conversation. One is the importance of this transnational experience that we're trying to build in partnership with the NVRC, the city of Alexandria and the city of Hamburg, because these two cities specifically are impacted by very similar flood hazard threats. So they're both in a similar uh, location, if you will, in which you get impacted by coastal flooding, you get impacted and you have suffered historical flooding over time. So there's a lot of lessons that have been learned across the Atlantic and a lot of really neat creative solutions that these uh, localities are putting in place. And I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity for exchange of information, but also opportunity for exchange of lesson learns and new technology and new alternatives, creative alternatives uh, that are being put in place. And today you're gonna hear about uh, both localities, I had the privilege to be able to visit the city of Hamburg and Hafen City and see firsthand really neat technology that have been put in place, which is really impressive. And I, I've been studying flood hazards for a long time and I was truly impressed by the solutions I've seen that. And of course, here in the city of Alexandria, there's no shortage of really creative solutions and initiatives also to make the city more, uh, resilience to flooding. And that goes uh, right into the core of what we're trying to do here at George Mason. We're the largest uh, public university in the state of Virginia. And we have two major initiatives within the university that within we've been working with the, and the NVRC team, the Institute for Sustainable Earth, that's trying to bring research and scholarship to our communities. And the recently launched Virginia Climate Center, which I'm part of, that we're really trying to support communities in the Commonwealth of Virginia to become more resilient and adapt to climate change. So the basic idea here is to bring research to the communities. And this is exactly what we're trying to do with the webinar and working with our local communities. So I'm delighted that we're able to put this uh, program together and I hope everybody enjoys listening from both opportunities so we can have a lively Q&A at the end. So without further ado, I'll pass along to U so he can uh, get going. Uwe, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you and welcome. Everybody, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and best regards from Hamburg. I'm very happy to share our experience and to explain the solutions we found to bring up uh, the best conditions for the new buildings and places in our city. So I will share my screen and I hope you We'll see my slides now, direct, okay, urban stormwater management. That is a major challenge for our project area, Hafen City. Um, <clears throat> so to give you an idea of Hafen City area, 
Um, Hafen City is under construction and under development from the year 2000 when we started on a very flexible and open master plan idea. Since 2000, we developed 10 different quarters by different urban design ideas. And you see the area of um, Hafen City in red here directly and close in close vicinity to the inner city um, where you see the Alster. This is one river in Hamburg and it's running through the whole city area with a lot of fleets and canals and it is going down through the inner city area to the river Elbe where the Hafen City is located. And the Hafen City area will extend the inner city area of Hamburg as the second largest city of Germany by 40%. And we can attract 45,000 jobs and places, working places here, mainly in offices, but a lot of also in retail, culture, social institutions, entertainment, also tourism and so on. And we will also in roughly 8,000 residential units will attract a new inner city population by roughly 16,000 people. Um, and so we are some kind of an um, experiment uh, because in Hamburg, a lot of people weren't in interested at all to live in the inner city of the Second World War times. And uh, so we, from the very beginning, had the idea that we can double the very small inner city population in Hamburg, but we can also uh, attract very different people so that we can regenerate the inner city as also a living area, as well as we have to bring up a lot of um, innovations in terms of city development and um, in terms of economic and development in Hamburg. And you see that Hafen City is uh, a former area of the port. So Hafen City area is more or less the birthplace of the modern harbor facilities in Hamburg in the mid 19th century. And since uh, the 1900 and 1880s, we are developing a lot of uh, very modern and in, um, harbor port uses and industrial facilities. So um, by a special situation in 1880, um, the whole area was excluded from the inner city of Hamburg or from the city area of Hamburg at that time um, by drawing a custom boundary around the whole area. And uh, we had since then only port facilities and storage and trading and shipping and so on, but no um, residents at all for more than 120, 140 years. So um, with the decision to develop Hafen City, we brought up the idea to extend the inner city in this area. And this is today's status. You see in the front our new landmark, the Alp Philharmonie Special Concert Hall, with also apartments and West Inn Hotel uh, function in that new block, um, um, new blazon block on uh, <coughs> brick building from the 60s. And then you see the area with a lot of very different um, places, buildings, and also um, a new grid of infrastructure. And the main thing was to protect those areas from the winterly storm floodings um, in a very uh, smart way because we were interested to save time and to save money. Um, Hamburg is located roughly 110 kilometers far away from the North Sea area. And the problem with the flood in Hamburg is that we face in the winter times a lot of strong storm surges in the Deutsche Bight. And so the water from the North Sea area will be pushed by the tide much higher into the river Delta, which is roughly there where Hamburg is located. Um, and then we have uh, higher water levels than normally. And you see there is the normal tide, it's a tidal range of roughly 3.6 meters, um, but we have a lot of um, different uh, flood situations in the last uh, 150 years. And normally we can see floodings in the winter time, but we had also in the last 150 years, five um, summer storm floodings. And the more or less highest level was in 1976. 
that uh, day or that time, everything was fine. Everything was protected by the new uh, enforced dikes. But we had in 1962 a uh, storm catastrophe because in 1962, the dikes were not strong enough. They were not fit and they were not fit enough um, to, fa to face the, the storm of 1962, which was in February and uh, some dikes broke and areas which are on a level of roughly and just um, 50 centimeters above sea level, they were flooded totally. And in one night, 300 people died in Africa. There was a, a very dramatic situation. And <clears throat> whenever we're talking about this, everyone in the city is remembering this and is related to the age um, of that, um, thinking of that. And um, everyone is sure that we have to bring up new areas which are absolutely safe in such cases. So, Hafen City is a special solution because um, you have to imagine that uh, Hafen City is an area of three former islands which were shaped in the 19th century to the area we can call today Hafen City. And uh, the inner city area is protected by this main embankment line. So where, wherever we have bridges from the inner city to our area, there we have um, gateways that we can close uh, heavy doors so that the water is not going into the inner city area. But uh, Hafen City and the so-called Speicherstadt, UNESCO World Heritage today, is in front of this main embankment line. And so the question was, how to protect the areas in front of the dike line. And the idea was to avoid a new dike line. By building a new dike line along Hafen City waterfront, uh, we were in the situation that we lose the viral and atmospheric contact through all the water places and to the River Elbe. And for sure, the question was how to save money at the time, because uh, normally we calculated in the late 90s, that we minimum need eight to 10 years after the whole um, first planning process before we can start building a new dike line because the, the dike line along the River Elbe means that there is a dike line along a national waterway. And that means that also Berlin would have in included into all the plannings and in into questions which were to solve. And uh, so um, we, brought up our own ideas by the um, concept that we bring up just the infrastructure and that we keep low special places, especially those um, public places and spaces along the waterfront. There is uh, an area of more than 10 kilometer length, which is a new promenade system, um, which is separated from the streets so that people can walk and cycle along the river without being in contact with the motorized individual um, traffic on the streets and roads. So this means that um, everything you see in um, yellow could be flooded without our concept. Um, and we calculated um, a design level of protection by, uh, by um, plus eight meters 30 above sea level and in special in special places we need about nine meter 50 above sea level but um, the this, the main question was how to bring up this in um, a very good condition so that um, we can um, overhand the responsibility for being protected or for, for in terms of um, protect themselves to the private developers and the private owners of the buildings. And the government um, is just watching that they follow the rules, the rules we designed. And there is a special um, ordinary in terms of the flood protection from the year 2002. And so we define the areas which uh, are, are affected by the flood. We um, brought up uh, a special concept so that we can name responsible persons. And uh, then we have also some special storm flood protection installations and a special plan and a special practices, special practices to be protected in the case of floodings. 
Um, to ensure this in terms of the topography, um, you see here the historic level of the harbor and port areas which were built in the 19th century. And for instance, this is a section through a part in the western half of the city, and there is a level of 4.5 to up to 5 meters above sea level. And that was um, the historic level area. So if there is a flood by 7.5 or 8.5 meters um, storm level, then for sure those areas would be flooded. So the question was how to bring up a new street grid that is protected. And therefore, we by um, bringing up more sand and material we need for the street to bring um, a better density in the ground, so that we, after six to six to nine months, we can then dig up it, uh, dig it, dig it away, and so then there is the new street level. That is the first thing. So this is the place where we build new streets, and then we have uh, the situation that public space along the promenades, the former K walls, and the street, there is public space, and. It in between the area of the promenade and uh, the area of the street, there is the site we offer to the private market companies, which we are interested to develop the sites by building um, mixed use functions and um, normally um, parking garage, two level um, parking garage underneath the new buildings. And if there then is a flood, just the promenade area is flooded, but not the street. So the streets are the streets can be used 24-7 with and um, without flooding situations for all the vehicles, for the individual traffic, as well as for fire brigades and uh, ambulances in the case of the flood, so that they can reach every building they have to go to. And uh, this is from the year 2003, something like that, for. Um, where you see how we brought up those new street level area. And this is like, um, so to speak, a spider web. So because um, the dwelling mounds in between of this grid uh, then can be de developed by the private companies with the buildings and um, everything is linked to a flood protected area behind the main embankment line so that fire brigades can come from um, those places uh, on those protected uh, street levels to the area of Hafen City. And so the orange areas then have a level of a minimum plus 7.5 meters above sea level and they are all flood protected in the situation. You can, you can see it here. Um, there is the promenade of Kaiser Kai, Montana Kai, and um, there is a new building, the white one, two white one buildings in um, the center of the image. Those are residential buildings, and you see the private garden yard um, and the um, patterns on the flood protection wall, which is um, the wall of the garage. And the empty side to the right, then there you see the level where they bring up the two stories of parking garage and then the level, the ground floor level of the buildings and the private yard, for instance, here, they are on the same level like the streets. So no problems for the people, no problems for the cars and the traffic, everything is safe, even if the promenade area is flooded. And there are the major accesses, um, flood protected streets and roads, which are linking those potential three islands of our area and everything is fine. So, and to give you the idea of the um, whole structure of um, downtown in a city area behind the main embankment line, the, Sp the Speicherstadt, the UNESCO World Heritage Storage Area um, in green here and Hafen City in, in front um, as the red colored area. So, um, <clears throat> To give you more spatial idea of um, the situation, this is a profile cut or a section through the area, and you see it here. Um, from right to left, there is the inner city behind the flood protection, the embankment line, then those two little buildings in the center. This is the historic area, which is um, 
not protected. So since they built in the 1880s, the first buildings, every building is uh, under preservation now and UNESCO World Heritage. So they will um, fight against the storm flooding like they did in 1880s. So they have to protect the doorways and uh, the um, windows to the um, cellar and uh, low-lying areas. And so this area is not protected. No fire brigades, no ambulances can reach them. So those buildings are still just working um, places uh, as they are preserved. And then at left, you see Hafen City on a protected level with the parking areas underneath. And so um, there are some um, pictures of the situation when there is a flood. Um, so the right, um, the view to, uh, to the new bridge through the storage, the historic area um, where the fire brigades can enter. And then if on the left-hand side, if the area of the storage buildings is flooded, like you see it here, the fire brigades can come uh, uh, via this new bridge and they are done on a flood protected level and can reach every building in Hafen City. This means that all the promenades, the places along the waterfront and um, everything which is not protected is absolutely fantastic. Um, it is historic, it is, um, or more or less also a monument of the port history and of the economic development of the port in the last 150 years. And we kept that like they were. And a lot of people love to do the Sunday walk uh, by sunshine and also rain in Harbu City. To give an idea of um, some special places. So wherever the water can come up, can reach the buildings. We have in front of entrances to the garage or to the staircases of the buildings, we have sliding doors. And very easily um, facility management teams can um, close those doors. Um, they through a type and so then everything is waterproof and fine. And so fire brigades and pedestrians then will walk on the upper level where you see um, those ways. And we have some special solutions at many retail and gastronomy places where we have watertight uh, facades. And so eventually the water is going uh, to this area. Um, and <clears throat> there is the promenade, which we opened in 2007 along uh, Danankai. Um, there is a special place, Alp Arcades, you see um, there is a gallery on the flood protected level and there is a pier in front. That is the lowest level in Hafen City at all. It is just by four meters, something like that. So this is the place which can be flooded first if there is a storm. And also there we have a lot of gastronomy places and um, sliding doors which are protecting this low lying level. And this is the situation in 2013 while of flooding. And you see the water is coming up in this situation about 30 to 50 centimeters on the promenade. And this situation will normally last for one and a half or two hours. And uh, when, with the, when by the next tide, the water is away again on the way to the North Sea, everything is fine like before. Um, you have to clean up a little bit, but later on, they can use the promenade as, as the day before. This is the same situation in a uh, other direction. And that is the, the main embankment line which is protecting the inner city. And the problem with that we identified is that when you're walking behind that, eventually you can have a look via this uh, strong wall, but you aren't in touch with the water as a natural element, and you are not uh, in touch with the atmosphere of the water, with, with the tide, and eventually also the flood. Um, so the question was to us, um, if we want to bring up very attractive public spaces uh, on those promenade along this waterfront on the promenades, and, and this is again the Alp Arcade, uh, then we need this system and we have to rule it that um, the 
construction companies, the developers will follow um, our major idea. If not, they cannot develop any building and they cannot bring, get any permission to use it at this very um, vibrant and attractive place. And the people love to um, enjoy those places uh, in the inner city. And that for sure is a very important um, so here I am again, or very important um, frame condition to bring up uh, an extension of the inner city to have the resilience for the future and to eventually to mitigate as well as to adapt everything we will see um, by the changing water levels in terms of the tide, but for sure also uh, eventually for the future in terms of climate change and uh, the conditions which affect us then, whatever they will be, I don't know at all. We know, I guess all of us know that we have to care a lot of um, our energy consumption, our sustainability in terms of uh, building, mobility, uh, heating, and so on. And that is also, everything is integrated in our sustainability concept but uh, the strong infrastructure idea of Hafen City was the um, major frame condition uh, for major framework of this development at all from the very beginning. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much, Uwe, that was fantastic. Um, the question was asked, <laughs> and I know we're gonna put questions towards the end, but um, will, 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 would we be able to share your slides with the participants? Yes, for sure. Yeah, for, for the personal use, uh, not to be published or something like that. And uh, you can use the PDF uh, I've sent you in advance. Great, fantastic. So we'll turn yeah. it over to you. While we're um, getting Daniel and Matthew are getting their slides up, I'll, uh, I can only recommend that everyone listening to this presentation, um, if they have the opportunity to go visit Hoffman City, it's exceptional. Um, Daniel, uh, floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, you, uh, Daniel, you muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Sorry about that. We can see your slides there, Daniel. Yeah, okay. Crystal clear. Very good. And you can hear me, correct? Correct. Sorry about that. It takes a little while to get these things uh, lined up. So anyway, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. We are very happy to share the podium with uh, Uva and compare notes of what our respective cities are doing. Um, we're going to talk about a holistic approach to flood resilience in Alexander, Virginia. And holistic, by holistic, we mean that we are looking at everything that is affecting us in the city when it comes to flooding. So our island is pretty simple. We have, we're gonna talk about the causes of flooding in Alexandria and the two programs that we have ongoing. The one I lead is called Flood Action Alexandria and it's about pluvial flood mitigation, meaning it's a rain that happens upland, mostly due to deficiencies in our drainage system. And then Matt will be talking about the waterfront implementation project, which deals with tidal flood mitigation in, in the city. 
So the causes of pluvial flooding in Alexandria are the ones that you probably came to know at some point in your careers, but we have it all in Alexandria. We've been around since 1749, and ever since we've been putting impervious surfaces down in the city. So existing impervious areas, when there were no regulations for reducing the impact of uh, stormwater, is one of the causes. And also we face new development and redevelopment still ongoing in the city that um, is increasing also the impervious. But at this point, we have very stringent rules to control the runoff from this development and redevelopment. So we're, we're mitigating, with, as, as the city redevelops, we are mitigating those impacts. It's just a slow process, project by project. The main cause is inadequate drainage. We, our pipes are old. I mean, some, some are 70 years old, maybe perhaps a couple are 100 years old. And they were designed when uh, the technology was different as well as uh, the climate was different. So at this point, we find ourselves dealing with uh, that legacy issue in, in the city. Um, other issues that we face, uh, some flow, encroaching on flow paths, there, there's many places in the city, we have certain drainage ways that need to be clear all the time for flooding, but for one reason or another, they get encroached upon by people, residents who don't know what the purpose is of these drainage ways. So compaction, as we know, every time there is some type of development, there's equipment that uh, compacts the soil, which reduces its permeability, its texture. And finally, I like to talk about lawns. We, in the United States, love our lawns, and they turn out to be not very permeable. So all these things combined are the reasons for our pluvial flooding problems in Alexandria. We also have tidal flooding because right there, we are right there next to the Potomac River. And every so often we get high tides, king tides, and we expect these things to get worse with uh, sea level rise caused by climate change. So those are the causes of flooding. And I'm going to talk about Flood Action Alexander, which is the program I lead, is devoted exclusively to pluvial flood mitigation program. So um, the motivation, of course, has been climate change. And we've seen um, very intense rainstorms that are coming to our area. 2018 was the wettest year on record. And that had, the trend has continued all the way to uh, last year when we've had very local flash floods in very localized areas. That's one issue that we face. We're getting these cloud bursts that move about the city. So sometimes it's very difficult to predict where things are going to happen. But overall, this is what we're facing today and what causes our upland flooding. So what we've done is we've uh, taken a holistic approach. So we're looking at all of the bullets that you see here because they somehow have an impact on how we prepare for flooding. So we are looking at uh, large capacity projects and spot improvements, which are smallish versions of that. We also need to um, maintain our drainage, our drainage system. So we have uh, operation uh, challenges as well. We have to maintain also our drainage waste streams and channels. Our, our uh, residents are extremely knowledgeable and um, they are concerned with the welfare of the city. So we have a very involved community in the city and we are glad for that because that makes us uh, certainly more effective. We also have some innovative uh, approaches. For example, the city has its own flood mitigation ground program that I'll discuss later. And we are able to do these things because we have also a stormwater utility fee that provides the dedicated sources of revenue for us to implement this program. So the, the first component, I'm just gonna go briefly over these components, are large capacity projects. These are very simple projects in theory. It just means the pipe is too small, we, we're going to open up a hole, remove the old pipe and put a bigger pipe. How hard can that be, right? Well, it, it, it's extremely difficult. There's um, utility conflicts, there's uh, maintenance of traffic issues. There's, there's a big hole in front of somebody's house for a long time. So we need to address those issues. Besides that, we are also looking into the effects of climate change. So we're designing these pipes so that we they can be around for another 70, 100 years 
and, and withstand the um, the changes caused by climate along the line. So this is um, our major infrastructure projects that are going on, and we have a total of eleven of those scheduled in uh, in the study that we perform. But we also have um, things that are smallish. Sometimes they tend not to be large, but really we call them spot improvements. Sometimes we can replace stormwater inlets and, and that improves the situation because the water now is able to get into the pipes. Even if the pipes are undersized, we don't want the stormwater inlet to be the, uh, the limiting factor here. So we, we, are, we have a very vibrant program to take care of these smaller things that together end up making our life easier along the lines. Um, we have also a, a very vigorous program to clean, to maintain the functioning of our storm drain system. So all these factors that you see here are uh, implemented on a, on a regular basis by our crews. Plus, we also receive information from our residents via a system that we call Alex 311, in which people can report uh, blockages on uh, different parts of infrastructure or any kind of anomaly that may become a problem if it happens to rain as it does in the city. So operation and maintenance is also a very important component for us. We have streams and channels and we have to maintain those as well. We have uh, stream restoration projects and we also have dredging projects in the city that uh, enable us to have uh, these drainage ways operating as they should. We have also um, a very involved program to get in touch with the residents. So, so we get a phone call. Somebody says, there's this flooding in my area. We deploy a team of engineers and we go visit, meet with the neighbors and um, figure out what's going on. If there really is a need for a project there, we formulate that project, we put it in the queue and we um, the, hire a designer to help us solve that problem. We've We've been able to implement many smaller projects like that that in the end end up being part of the bigger picture. Communications. This is something that uh, we feel very proud of at the City of Alexandria because we are um, fortunate to have the resources to hire a communications officer whose sole purpose is to take the information that we generate in the program, transmit it to the public, whether it be by uh, video clips or social media, newsletters. Uh, and, and we've gotten an uh, increasingly larger audience for these uh, outlets to not only publicize what we're doing in the city, but also receive information about how we could do our job better. So communications are very important to us in the program. Uh, I mentioned our mitigation plan program. We uh, actually can help neighbors install, take care of themselves. We can help them with 50% uh, of the expenses of putting things like this. Let's say a floodgate here that would limit access of floodwaters to a basement or on the lower right, elevation of utilities that would otherwise get damaged by floodwaters. So we're able to contribute 50% up to $5,000 of the expenses that homeowners uh, may incur by taking care of these things. This is Helpful not only because it addresses the problem, but it also gives agency to our constituents and say, you don't have to sit there. You can do things. We'll help you. We'll do, take care of the bigger things, but it will also help you with the smaller things. And we have some very um, interesting stories of success from residents being able to take advantage of this program. So in essence, that's what um, the program is in Flood Action Alexandria. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Matt Landis, who's going to talk about the Waterfront Implementation Project. Matt? Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Uwe, for your presentation. Uh, I think there's a lot of correlations between Hoffman City and, and the work there and, and the challenges that we have in Alexandria. I'll highlight some that are the same and some that are different. I think as you see the overview here, just as, as in Hoffman City, we have a situation where we're immediately adjacent to a, a river. And in fact, the city of our, our city and, and our history is, is unable to be separated from the, the life of the river. And much of the historic development occurred in Old Town Alexandria 
because of that uh, connection to the river and, and developed in low-lying areas that were flood prone, but also enabled for commerce and trade and, and access to the water, both recreationally and, and for commerce and, and riverine um, access to food and, and to transport. And so that, that historic connection is, is really critical to the city um, in one of our uh, most historic and, and most uh, tourist centric uh, locations. And we're also fortunate that um, for our particular project, the, the core area, if you will, for these four blocks um, is primarily under uh, public ownership. Uh, and so, whereas in Hoffman City, it sounds like there is a, a focus on leveraging uh, redevelopment uh, by private interests to incorporate flood mitigation. Um, in this instance, the city is actually the owner uh, for near nearly the majority of the waterfront in this area that is most susceptible to flooding and impacted by not only riverine flooding, uh, but stormwater flooding. Uh, and so that we have to consider both those solutions. And so we're working from the public standpoint um, to work as the, as the driver of the project and incorporate solutions that are um, you know, publicly developed and publicly installed uh, uh, by the city and the municipal entity. And so Dan, if you go to the next slide, there's, there's really three sources of flooding. And Dan talked a little bit about um, uh, the stormwater related ones throughout the city in our upland areas. In our historic area here in Old Town, right next to the river, we're really dealing with three different types of flooding. And so we're looking at uh, the backflow of the river and, and mid to high tide events uh, from the Potomac coming up into our sewer system and actually backing up into our streets and causing localized uh, flooding, which we sometimes refer to as sunny day flooding, where there isn't really a, a stormwater event required for us to have flooding in the streets, which, which is a little bizarre and a little bit embarrassing. And then there is the overtopping of our bulkhead and our shoreline conditions, um, both due to just tidal, uh, tidal events, uh, but also especially uh, flood events. And then there's the inundation of our storm sewer. So as Dan indicated, much of our historic area especially is um, woefully undersized uh, to handle the capacity of the stormwater uh, that we're dealing with now, especially since uh, some of these really more intense storms that we've seen. So 2018 being some of the wettest year on record and, and with some of the mo most intense storms that we've seen, we've really seen uh, the changes uh, then and since uh, with that greater intensity and the need for a much larger storm sewer capacity system. So in this, this tight urban and historic area uh, adjacent to the river, we really have to come up with innovative solutions uh, that address all three types of those, but also respecting the history, that connectivity to water, just as Uwe said, the, the, the connection of people to water uh, that drives interest in being here and, and maintains that historic connection to the river and, and of our city without impacting our historic buildings and historic infrastructure is really critical. So Dan, if you go to the next slide, please. So just as a, as a kind of point of reference, this is that same kind of four block area here. Um, and you can see uh, not only is the public infrastructure impacted there in our parks and along our riverfront and marina, uh, but many of the historic buildings, uh, both from a commercial standpoint uh, for businesses, but also some of the residential buildings that have been redeveloped or uh, remain historic, are, are impacted uh, anywhere from an elevation of about a uh, flood elevation of about four foot all the way up to our 100 year flood elevation of 10.2. So anything that occurs in that range really is impacting our streets, our ability for emergency access. Uh, creating pretty well, uh, you know, pretty big cleanup efforts uh, after an event, uh, but also impacting businesses, tourists, and, and emergency services. And so um, this is sort of a, a multifaceted need for us to address this. It's not just inconvenient. There's also life safety elements, um, but it's a cost to the city in many respects. And so, um, you know, with a lot of our low-lying areas being at uh, around uh, elevation three or three and a half feet, um, you know, anything uh, above that is really impacting us in some capacity. Now, many of our park spaces are already fairly resilient, um, but there's a high cost of those being closed and being cleaned up after an event. And those frequency, the frequency of those uh, events are increasing and the severity is increasing. And so more and more businesses and buildings are impacted as well. So if you go to the next slide, Dan, that means that we have to address all three types of those floodings. And so, the, you know, backflow prevention into our sewer system, increasing uh, the sewer capacity, um, you know, will address both the, the conveyance uh, or the capacity issues, but also uh, preventing that inundation of our storm sewers through backflow and through pumping of that storm water. And then the overtopping of the bulkhead uh, from the riverine environment means uh, either increasing our flood elevation at the bulkhead 
or inland and doing so in a manner that doesn't disrupt that, that connectivity, uh, the historic nature of a riverfront and, and the water-based activity there, or disrupting the key views that make the businesses and the tourist attractions uh, so interesting and continue to tell the story of Alexandria and making it a vibrant place to be. And so our project is really flood mitigation, but also a you know, placemaking and space making space making challenge as well that we're trying to balance in, in an integrated solution uh, that is both resilient and, and covers us for the foreseeable future for climate change. Next slide, please. So we're working on addressing these goals. I'm not going to read them all, but I, I think one of the, the key elements is that tension uh, between this being a, a flood mitigation project and a space making project and one that honors our history and that some of the um, some of the options available to projects where there is totally new development and can be incorporated into new development uh, aren't so much available to us, especially for some of our historic buildings, and that we really are trying to maintain or improve connectivity within our public realm and our public spaces, uh, while also uh, incorporating this new infrastructure and new stormwater management. So next slide. So as a starting point, um, you know, back uh, in 2018 and 2019, our city council endorsed uh, a conceptual plan, a very schematic plan that was primarily a space making project uh, that came out of a small area plan uh, and planning process and civic engagement process that was very in depth about what does a world class waterfront look like? How does it perform? What types of programming can happen here? And what are our goals and objectives for, for people to move freely uh, in and around these spaces, uh, but to, to improve and, and, and even uh, increase uh, the desire to be in this space? And so that was the original intention. But as we, as we also looked in, uh, forwards for climate change and for the flood mitigation and convenience, uh, Council also indicated, and if you go to the next slide, Dan, that this was also uh, really needing to be a flood mitigation project. And through our community prioritization process and our civic engagement, um, I think even to many people's surprise because of the strength of the, the planning effort and the, and the wonderful vision that was created, um, that flood mitigation actually rose to the top of the list uh, to address that first and foremost, and, and to work first on that connectivity on the riverfront promenade, and then being able to phase in improvements as we could afford to do them. And so that continues to be our prioritization that's been validated through a lot of ongoing civic engagement. Um, but as many of you all probably know, costs are increasing dramatically. Uh, they have through the pandemic and they will likely for the foreseeable future. And so one of the innovative um, tactics that we've taken or approaches that we've taken this project, project is also our project delivery method. And so if you go to the next slide, Dan, I'll continue to talk about it. But um, we, we basically have continued to run cost estimates as we've evaluated and refined our concept planning to look at what that baseline project would cost us. And the, um, the desired project through that public planning process would result in a project probably around 200 to 250 million dollars. And with all of the various priorities that the city has to address uh, for capital projects, uh, ongoing operation and maintenance and state of good repair, investing in schools, et cetera, and just generally operating, um, there's real constraints that we have to face while we're also addressing the other inland flooding issues and, and other, other requirements of our city. And so we were afforded about $102 million uh, for us to work within. And so we, we shifted from a design bid build project delivery method uh, to a more innovative and collaborative method, which is still fairly untested in, in the civil infrastructure space for a progressive design build project. And so we, we are scoping to budget as opposed to um, developing a set scope and then realizing later how much that might cost us uh, and, and have some shock and awe. And so we have also applied for some grant funding, which is uh, one was su successful, one is outstanding with FEMA for a $50 million grant. So our scope may change and the progressive delivery method allows us to be flexible. And if our budget expands, uh, to continue to increase the scope of the project in a collaborative delivery method that is adaptive to uh, our budget and responsive to it within those limits and allows us to maximize our investment and best balance um, resiliency and investment in infrastructure with the space making and place making goals that we also have. And through an iterative pricing model and a guaranteed maximum price, we reduce our risk, um, but also allow us to engage both the community and a consultant and contractor and really being clear about what our likely pricing is uh, to limit our risks. So go to the next slide, please, Dan. 
So some of the core project elements that we're facing now, and we're, we're at, in the active procurement phase for our progressive design build contractor. So we've, we've done a lot of conceptual planning and cost modeling and stormwater modeling, um, but we're really just now in the process of hiring our design team. So from a conceptual standpoint, uh, the expectation is that we'll have at least two pump stations that would help us with the uh, elimination of tidal dependency of our stormwater system to operate. Uh, so instead of having to wait for the river to fall below our stormwater outfalls uh, by actively pumping water when there is a major storm event, um, we can still drain our streets and manage our stormwater. And so that's a that's a critical goal uh, of this project. Uh, it's not um, absolutely set yet. A further investigation and evaluation is warranted from a cost benefit and environmental standpoint. Uh, but there's a possibility that we'll utilize some underground detention or stormwater attenuation, uh, sort of like underground cisterns to attenuate stormwater, temporarily store it, and utilize that in conjunction with the pump stations uh, to manage that stormwater. That's not for the riverine water solution, just for the stormwater. And then further streetscape and, and stormwater infrastructure improvements and space making improvements uh, would be the other. So upsizing our stormwater pipes and inlets, et cetera. And so from our original baseline design uh, as a cost saving measure, but also to maximize our investment in the public space, we really took a shift to try to utilize landscape based flood protection measures, whether that's um, berms and planters or landscape elements that can actually achieve a flood protection elevation while, while providing public amenity, aesthetic interest and, and public benefit or utilizing the, the resilient elements of our landscape that we already have to benefit from instead of solely relying on a gray uh, solution with a bulkhead. But then also looking at either future proofing or increasing our flood protection elevation with deployable technology. Uh, so whether it's gates or barriers at buildings or specifically for along sections of our promenades uh, where we can, as you see on the whole right-hand side there with the yellow barriers deployed, uh, from the middle picture to the right picture, that's the same uh, same park, uh, but with a, a hidden barrier when we're in uh, good conditions. But then when a storm or flood condition were occurred that the Potomac was overtopping our bulkhead, these could be either automatically or manually deployed uh, based on the, the technology that we were to pursue. So there's a whole host uh, of options available to us. Um, they are being increasingly utilized in, in the United States and across the globe. And so I think many cities are facing the same challenge of maintaining their connectivity to water, maintaining public access, but also providing uh, flood protection when needed. And so this is one potential option that we're very excited about and um, will actually anticipate uh, higher levels of flood protection than in our, our baseline project if we're successful with a, a FEMA grant that we've applied for and that we should know about by the end of the summer here. And so uh, Dan, if you wanna continue on, so just looking at uh, how we've scoped a budget so far, there really is a hybrid of utilizing some new bulkhead uh, as well as some landscape-based flood protection. And, and then also the stormwater elements of, of pump stations and a new uh, pump infrastructure, pipe infrastructure and inlets to manage both the stormwater and the overtopping uh, of the river. And so I can answer any questions about this if we have time, but, but in essence, I, I really wanted to just hit home that this is uh, sort of a hybrid of um, some of the gray infrastructure improvements that were originally conceived for the project, but also really shifting into a, a resiliency oriented approach that allows for some spaces to flood in the less frequent uh, times that a higher uh, higher stormwater event or, or riverine flooding event were to occur. And so as opposed to conveying to the community that we're protecting against all flooding within a hundred year flood event, we're saying that we're gonna aim to protect it against the most frequent types of flooding and then recover very quickly in a resilient manner uh, if we were to exceed those on a rare occasion. And so that's that's the, the balance we're having to strike uh, to scope to budget and, and one that involves a lot of communication uh, with our, our public and our decision makers and that we will continue that process of kind of conveying options and the costs and the benefits as we continue to plan and scope to budget uh, in case any decision makers and, and those that uh, allocate funding to us um, determine that actually we need more money or if we had to work for less, uh, that we still achieve the maximum benefit to our community. And so this is a section, if you will, um, that shows from the left-hand side working to the right at the river, um, working with the, the streets and inlets and the, and the sewer infrastructure to upsize that, uh, to pre-treat that, and then to pump that. 
uh, into the river such that uh, regardless of the river elevation or flood condition, that we're able to, to sort of dewater our streets, if you will, uh, and, and allow us to manage that, that, flood, that flood water from the localized flooding that is now currently impacting us pretty severely. And so, Dan, if you go to the next slide. We did a whole host of modeling to help convey not only to our decision makers, but also the community uh, about what the infrastructure we're proposing uh, would achieve for us. So what do you get for the investment, if you will? And so this is from the stormwater side. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see our existing system and just how deep some of those segments get uh, up over two feet of water in some of our lowest lying areas and most impacted areas at the bottom of our watershed. Uh, whereas on the right-hand side, if we were to implement the proposed solutions with increased capacity pipes and inlets with the pump stations and separating us from the dependency on a on a gravity-based system, uh, we can, even in a flood stage condition or with a tailwater condition, um, have two inches or less of water in our streets, which is very, very manageable and uh, allows for vehicles and pedestrians to safely uh, be in those spaces. And so this is at a two-year storm event. If you continue on, Dan, you can see the severity at a 10-year event, uh, just how dramatically that floods and to what extent. And then again, with our proposed infrastructure, uh, just how wonderful the improvement would be. And again, this doesn't protect against all storms, but it dramatically improves our performance in even larger storms and helps us more, recover more quickly. And so that message again of quick recovery of resilience is really important uh, to convey to, to all as we, we decide on how to proceed here. And so, as I said, this is about a $100 million project. You can see in the breakdown here, just where a lot of that investment is going and primarily it is in the flood mitigation and so uh, much less investment is possible in our public spaces and our public improvements. And as a landscape architect, that pains me, um, but that's that, that's that tension that we have to try to balance. And in any innovative uh, means that we can come up with, um, having a double bang for our buck in our flood mitigation area helps either offset that cost or allows us to have greater investment in that, that public amenity and public infrastructure, which is equally important um, to the community and to our, our, our council. And so um, really wanted to stress that that balance is what we're going to be trying to strive for in our in our delivery method and that that uh, that delivery method allows us that opportunity. Next slide. I want to just thank everyone for the opportunity and, and thank you for your time. And I think we're moving towards questions now. So thank you so much. Well, great. Um, thank you all for those wonderful presentations. We do have some questions already in the chat, and it looks like we also have a hand raised. Um, so why don't we go ahead with Joan, if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Sure, thank you. And um, thank you for this really fabulous presentation, everyone. Um, I've been to uh, Hoffman City several times when Jurgen was uh, running it and have several tours and watched its development. And this is really exciting to see this kind of partnership and how they, um, Alexandra is, is taking some of those principles. When I was studying Hoffman City compared to Boston, one of the things is, yes, it seems that the building owners were responsible for the elevations and so forth, but that the city through ownership of the land had quite a bit of leverage with the building owners. And for me, I thought that was one of the most critical elements of the success compared to say a place like Boston that has, um, you know, the majority of the coastline is privately owned. So I was quite surprised to hear Matt about this whole area that was city owned. And so maybe if you could talk a little bit about city ownership of of land and how that shapes the ability and really limits it for cities where most of their coastline is privately owned. I can start and let my colleagues uh, uh, jump in as well. I, I think to start with, um, it, it's first an opportunity because we have uh, a, a great amount of uh, control or influence on how those spaces can operate and how they serve the public interest. And so we're not dependent on private development to that. But then we are there by also limited by our own funding or ability to, to seek alternative funding for that, whereas a private development uh, seems to often have an endless well of, of investment that they can make. And so uh, across the river, 
private development uh, just recently redeveloped the Anacostia River into a much higher uh, riverine flood protection elevation in a vi really vibrant manner um, and didn't have some of the constraints that we have. And I think that um, the fact that a lot of our developable area is historic and is um, not slated for redevelopment anytime soon, it really makes it incumbent on the city uh, to acknowledge that a lot of the development has occurred and um, has a long lifespan ahead of it, likely from a commercial um, and, and building uh, longevity standpoint. And so it, it remains on our on our shoulders to um, address some of these public issues and, and public concerns. And so we're, we're taking that opportunity uh, very seriously. Now, I think there is, as Dan mentioned, a, a grant program, and there are plenty of opportunities for private owners to um, voluntarily uh, make improvements, uh, but that we are not in a, in a situation right now where that's compulsory or mandated. Um, but if there was redevelopment uh, at any point, um, there would be new requirements likely placed upon uh, developers at, at that time. Uh, does that answer your question? It's very helpful. Thank you. I'd like to follow up maybe at another point. Great. Thank you, Joan. Um, we have some questions in the chat as well. Um, Adrielli has a question. Does Alexandria have approximate values of damage caused by floods in general in recent years? Uh, I'll take a step at it. We've um, we've collected some data, but the truth is we don't have uh, a, a systematic way to list that information. And I would add to that when we applied for our FEMA grant recently, um, you know, that was one of the elements uh, of the application was trying to assess those costs. And, you know, many of the costs are really um, experienced by private landowners. So there's a public cost to our response to events. Uh, to clean up after them or to improve infrastructure, replace infrastructure when it's impacted. But the impacts to businesses in terms of their businesses being closed or having to, to heavily clean or, or replace items or food uh, or just their general loss of revenue um, is really difficult to assess, but is, is a key element of, of, of an impact to us. And I think that's only likely to increase with climate change and more frequent and more intense events. And so um, we did our best to... Uh, provide the information we could. But again, private losses are not something that are reported to the city. And so we utilized um, a methodology through FEMA to assess that. And that's part of our application, but it is a real challenge. And, and I think uh, one that's difficult to quantify. Quickly, we had another follow-up question in the chat of what FEMA grant um, you're referring to there. Thank you. Sure. It's the Building Resilience uh, in Infrastructure and Communities, or the BRIC grant through FEMA. And so that's a $50 million uh, grant that we have applied for. It's the maximum amount of an award that's possible, uh, where they give up to 50% of, of the cost to a cap of $50 million. And so with a $100 million project, um, you know, that that $50 million would, uh, would basically double our uh, investment. And so we're not looking at that necessarily as a complete offset but to allow us to do more uh, to protect and to, to future proof, if you will, uh, for climate change and otherwise. Awesome. All right, we have a question from Satoshi now. Um, what are some concerns that your stakeholders have raised with various options? And um, Satoshi, feel free to come off mute, but I believe this refers to for the waterfront um, projects. Yes, thank you. Um, I was curious about um, uh, what kinds of concerns the um, the property owners, various stakeholders have raised um, during the public outreach process? Certainly. Thank you for the question. Uh, I would say it spans the spectrum from we're not doing enough to we're doing too much. Um, in terms of the not doing enough, I think folks are worried, uh, you know, why aren't we protecting to the 100-year storm or, or greater? And we've had a lot of um, information sharing about the foreseeable lifespan of this infrastructure and within the climate models that we have access to now. And um, the relative accuracy of those, uh, making good decisions about for a 50-year or 75-year uh, lifespan of this infrastructure, what's that right level of protection, and trying to help folks understand how we're arriving at those conclusions and um, where we are constrained financially. Um, and so I think I would say that's one concern. Um, on, the, on the other hand, I think there's some concerns that, uh, you know, we're by investing so much in flood mitigation, we're not investing in other areas of the city or in our public amenities. And again, since this was a, a 
the envisioning process was this to be a world-class waterfront with with massive investment in materials and and design and and uh fine fine elements that really attracted the people and made this a really uh wonderful and engaging space environment space to be in and so that that tension is is uh, i think felt by the community uh feeling like their expectations were higher than what maybe we're able to deliver at least in this first phase and so that's a reality that we're having to communicate openly and transparently about and um you know there's there's due process for our constituents to reach out to their um their counselors and their and their the leaders of our community to indicate whether that's satisfactory to them or not but we have to just be very honest about what we can and can't do uh, if we're scoping the budget so i'd say the last one i'd mention is that for the underground storage for example um there is a, a large and beloved passive uh, recreation park uh, named Founders Park that um, has a lot of mature trees, uh, a very vibrant and active community that uses it. And um, the underground storage that we show as an option there uh, would be a, a large impact, uh, both for the construction staging period, but then, you know, recovering from, um, you know, that that initial construction phase uh, with homes and, and some businesses immediately adjacent to it. That's a disruption that uh, many are not really excited about and that wasn't initially anticipated in the original baseline design. And um, there's also some soil contamination from prior land use and historic industrial activity that would, would be a cost to the project. And again, if there's cost in one area, it means we, we may not be able to do something else. And so we have to, to balance those and further evaluate that to see if it's uh, the right way to handle that uh, attenuation and storm water management. So those are three uh, three key items. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, Dale, you had your hand up, and then we'll take uh, two more questions in the chat for now. Yeah, I was going to ask uh, Celso, put him on the hot spot, since he's uh, observed the developments on both sides of the Atlantic and had the opportunity to walk around. What were sort of your impressions of what you saw um, in Hoffman City when we were together with Uva? So that's a great question, actually. And I was going to ask uh, a question for Uwe. So I'll take this opportunity to ask him a question, which was, so it, it seems like, and it looks like when I was there, that you arrived at this ultimate textbook, living in harmony with water situation in which you've done everything right. And then you can now really be living with water in harmony and you have it all set up. Now, I imagine that was a hard process to get to, and this is really like a template to be following and really an ultimate goal to get to. What were like the main lessons you learned along the way? And what were like some takeaways that you got out of that process that were like, aha, like if it weren't for this or, or this was crucial for us to make this work or were there like some big lessons that you all learned in the process that you could share with us? Hmm. So, um, first of all, I have to remark that it is for sure much more easier to build new, the infrastructure, the topography, um, without having any private uh, ownership in the area and uh, to set up very new conditions than to change um, the relation land, water, private, public, um, history and future and so on. So it seems to be much easier, but for sure, um, Hamburg had to decide on its own um, how to deal with the situation. So eventually I had to explain Hamburg is city and state as well. And Hamburg is one of 16 states in Germany. And so along the River Elbe, we have two neighbors. Um, from the North Sea uh, to the north, there is running the uh, neighbor state Schleswig-Holstein. And to the south of the rivers, there's running the neighbor states Lower Saxonia. Lower Saxony. So, um, in the major difference is uh, compared to, for instance, the Netherlands or, or Denmark, um, where um, protection of the shore and the land and so on is a national task. In Germany, the flood protection is a state task. And since a long, long time, we have a discussion in, in Germany 
how to deal with uh, rising water levels uh, and so on, climate change effects and so on. So, um, but there is no integrated solution how to do it in an integrated way among those three states in Northern Germany or among the federal, uh, all the federal states of Germany. So um, the question was very complex, how to solve um, or how to decide and uh, on its own for Hamburg and how to solve uh, the the, um, the problems or the challenges. So uh, that is uh, my uh, first remark to that. Um, then for sure, um, it was, uh, as I explained well, by the charge um, in 2002, when we had uh, decided or set up our own uh, flood ordinance um, in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the development of Hafen City. And um, the decision was made by several reasons. And uh, one was time, the other one was money. And for sure, the, the more important one was the question of placemaking. Um, when, when Matthew and uh, Daniel talked about. So um, how to bring up a very attractive uh, place by hopefully low cost relatively to the major investment which we want to attract, uh, which we wanted to attract. So um, to give you an idea of the, of the major investment we see in the whole Hafen City development process, so when everything is realized um, at the end of the 20s, this century, then we will have a major and overall investment of roughly 13 to 13.5 billion dollar. And um, this is a relation of three billion dollar public money to 10, minimum 10 billion dollar of private money, which is into be, which is to be invested in the private projects. And minimum 50% of the public money, uh, which is invested in our project, is generated by the land sale of the 120 plots we can offer. So placemaking, money general or finance generation and um, realization of, of a very good piece of, of city and, and urban um, environment which is attracting people and um, companies as well as tourists and investment um, not only by building half a city but also by operating half a city in the future and uh, that was the major thing and uh, we have a long long tradition of social democrats um, government in in hamburg and um, uh, related to uh, all social democrats in Germany, I would say um, that those in Hamburg are those one who think in a very economic uh, efficiency um, way. So, um, you know, um, Hamburg is prominent for the history of the private merchants and the um, shipping economy. And the politicians in Hamburg learned a lot of I, um, learning from the merchants and um, traders and so on. So and that is eventually uh, a, an explanation which will give you an idea of, of what we are thinking now, what we are integrating in, in these complex solutions. And um, so that the, the uh, private developers got to bring up the garages at the part of the um, uh, integrated flood con um, protection concept. That was the major thing. Huh? So they have to build walls around the garage in the basement. And so why don't use them as a part of the flood protection concept for the whole area or for the area, area at all? So that was, so, but, um, they have for sure have uh, eventually higher costs uh, than compared to other places in Hamburg where they also can build residential and, and office buildings. But for sure it is the attraction of the waterfront and, and we integrated everything. That was the major idea. 
But we have also now, Hafen City is uh, um, also working on three other major developments in Hamburg now. So the Senate uh, ordered us to bring up also uh, an area to a better quality and to better conditions where we have only 25% of the land uh, owned by the city. In Hafen City, it was roughly 100%. Um, but in a very um, close area, um, the next step, so to speak, um, is Billabong to the, to the east of Hafen City. And uh, there we have also a waterfront, um, not with um, tidal change, but a waterfront. And um, we are working on the idea to convince the private owners to change and to offer to the city parts of those properties so that we can also bring up uh, public spaces along the waterfront. And for sure, with this attraction, then eventually their properties will uh, be much more interested for new investments. And so then the idea is to bring up there a win-win situation, eventually a win-win-win situation um, to the public, to the private, and to all of us. Great, thank you. We have just a few more minutes. So um, the next few questions in the chat tie nicely together. Um, first are, what are the best practices from Hamburg that you've drawn into your program for Alexandria? Or perhaps what elements from the presentation could you see being applied in Alexandria? And tied with that is a question for Uva, do you think cities in the US like Alexandria can replicate Hamburg's experience with developing marine subversion friendly design in mind? So why don't we start with Alexandria and then move to Uva? Sure, thank you. I think one of the, the primary things that jumped out uh, was the use of uh, promenades and, and public spaces to be uh, resilient and to be um, effective for use when uh, an event, a stormwater event or a flooding event is, is not underway, um, but then to allow those areas to flood intentionally, but uh, be designed in such a manner that you recover quickly from that event. Uh, I'd say that's one. I think the use of either deployable gates or barriers or um, protections for uh, building facades and, and building penetrations is another. And uh, that's a key element that we're considering uh, for select areas, particularly if we were to get that grant uh, and be able to afford a much broader and higher level of protection. Those were the, I'd say the key ones that stand out, uh, but also I think maintaining access even during an event. So whether that's for emergency vehicles or uh, maintenance of utilities and quick recovery, um, I think that not in the same way, but in the same uh, effect and approach, uh, trying to find ways to make sure our, our critical infrastructure is, is accessible and safe and open, uh, we can operate and, and, and uh, address emergency needs uh, quickly and, and efficiently, despite having a, a stormwater or flood mitigation event. I'll just add to that, that um, it, uh, the, the experience in Haven City, it you know, teaches people to live with the water in, in a certain way. So it's, it, we can't avoid, we don't want to avoid the water, but, but we need to learn how to live with it. So that was uh, interesting to me. Great, and Uva, anything to add to that or what you could potentially draw from Alexandria's work as well? Um, it is a complex situation because I don't know, uh, that much uh, I should know about the River Potomac uh, or other rivers in the US. But um, I would say the, the, the major thing is, as uh, Daniel said, um, to teach the people to change their mind. So if this is possible, then they will eventually also accept that they have a lot of um, changes around their homes and and waters in the city and parts in the city. And um, as I told you, we had a flood in 1962, and that especially um, affected an island within the river. Um, there's an island in the River Elbe and in the estuary of the River Elbe, where 50,000 people are living uh, today. And since 62, and the catastrophe when 300 people died by night, 
was always that the people were afraid of the water and the existing of the surrounded uh, island and the water was from uh, all directions and um, potential danger and risk. And uh, we had the IBA in 2006 to 2013. And one important thing was to bring up new places along the waterfront where the people were able to enjoy the waterfront and to learn um, a new um, attitude uh, uh, in terms of we are close to the water or the water is around us. And, and an island is for sure uh, a more complex thing than a waterfront along uh, the northern part of the city of Hamburg, uh, along the um, inner city. So, but in the moment we are working on linking all those places. So the water is everywhere in Hamburg and um, we have not only the tidal driven um, floodings, we have for sure also the, the heavy rain uh, fall situations um, in, in the future. And for sure Hamburg is also thinking about a lot um, 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 about um, sponge city ideas so that we can collect, collect the water, that we also can eventually store the water. But in the moment when we have too much rainwater and in the next three weeks, we have less rainwater because we all uh, brought it to the river and to the sea and we get rid of the masses of water. And uh, the next month we have less water and all the trees in the city will uh, dry and uh, Hamburg is very prominent for all the trees. We have much more trees than people in, in Hamburg and uh, every tree in Hamburg, uh, we are very green metropolis, uh, eventually one of the greenest metropolis this side of, size of uh, 2 million people. And uh, every people, uh, they love the trees and for sure the trees are very important for good air condition and so on. So the natural air condition, I mean. Um, and so we need the water and the people must get a very, very good um, relation to the element of water, especially in a port city for sure. So, and this is um, a mind change process. And, um, um, as we discussed also well, the last hour, um, it will take us a long time, but we have not a long time to change the mind and to, to change things. And I, I guess, um, and we guess that uh, it's much more important to change the behavior of the people and to teach them how they have to change and what they have to change than to invest money and money and money in higher dikes and more pumps and more this and more that. Um, eventually, at the end of the, this challenge, we will fail or lose uh, if we only think uh, we, can, we can bring up solutions by money. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you for those responses. I see it's 1.30 now and we want to be respectful of everybody's time, but um, thank you so much for attending. Again, this webinar has been recorded, so we'll post this on NBRC's website and on our YouTube page. And then with permission from our presenters, we'll also include the slides on there. Um, if you did have any additional questions, I believe the contact information um, is on NBRC's website as well. Any other remarks, Dale? No, thank you so much, everybody. What a great job. Thank you so much.